we carry on with the terminology of and operations with two and three dimensional shapes. Very nice and interesting because we see all these different shapes in real life every day. They are again the learning outcomes, which I'm not going to read through. You can do it on your own, but it's very nice. All the learners enjoy doing all these different activities. The points on the line, there we see on a line, this is a line AB, starts from A to B, and we call this a line segment, the terminology. And this is the line segment XY, the point X, where AB crosses CD, how we draw the lines, how to draw perpendicular lines. This is a set square. It has one angle of 90 degrees. It's important to teach the learners what 90 degrees is. How to draw the um, line AB and then perpendicular line on it. We have the AB and we can place our set square on top of it and just draw a straight line vertically on the horizontal line. So it's a vertical line on the perpendicular line BAB. How to draw parallel lines? Suppose you want to draw a line through point P which is parallel to AB. You use your set square and there's your AB and P must be parallel to that one. Oh, no, through P. So you can use your set square and place it on your line AB. There's your line AB, and you place it on top of it, and you mark your point B, and you make it parallel. Let's see this learning activity. Use a ruler and set square to draw the following lines. A line perpendicular to line X, Y at the point B. So you can use your set square and move it. Your set square... There it is. Then you can move it to this point there and make your point. And then you draw your line parallel to AB. Right. The naming of the angles. Here we see angle. A, B, C, and B is always the angle between the A and the C. And here in this case, L between K and N. So this is your angle. This one looks like 90 degrees. And the complete turn is 360 degrees. One degree, we write like one with a small circle there. The protractor, please let your learners use protractors and compasses to work with. To put it down the correct way, not up, upside down. Some learners are putting it down upside like this. Put your protractor down and we work from the center and from the line. Not the end of the protractor but from the line of the protractor. From the zero line. We always start counting from the zero. We can turn our protractor or we can turn our page to measure angles. 180 degrees will be a straight line. And 40 degrees, if we have to draw this, we put it at the center on the zero of your line. And then you measure this case from the inside, 10, 20, 30, 40 degrees. If you have to measure 135 degrees, you always start from zero. You can start either from this side or that side. 
depending on where your line starts in your center. Zero, there we go, up to 100. Zero, up to 100. 110, 120, 135. So there, from that side to that one. And then we must show where the angle is. For example, in this case, where is the angle? Is it the acute angle here? Or is it the other angle on the other side? The acute angle between 0 and 90 degrees. The word acute means sharp. So it's a sharp angle. And then the right angle, it is exactly 90 degrees. The vertical line and the horizontal line are meeting each other at 90 degrees and show your angle. And that could also be a 90 degrees angle, a right angle. The obtuse angle, that angle is between 90, so it's more than 90, and less than 180. So it's between 90 and 180 degrees. More than 90, but less than 180 between those two. We call that the obtuse angle. The straight angle, straight line, it's exactly 180 degrees, so it's 90 plus 90 degrees. That's a straight angle. The next one is the reflex angle, the big angle. And we must show where the angle is. It's not the small one here, the obtuse angle. It's the reflex angle, the big angle, reflex. And it is between 180 degrees and 360 degrees. <coughs> Constructions are very important, even for the teachers in the assignments and in the examination. You must be able to do construction. So you need a protractor, a ruler, a sharp pencil, eraser to do this. How to draw angles. They are teaching us here what we have to do. Straight line drawn with a ruler and showing where the angle is. In this case, they've measured 125 degrees. So there is our angle. And here are some activities. Use a protractor to measure these angles. So we put the protractor there at the center on the line zero. And we read from the inside 40. 42 degrees. Here we must measure this angle. So we will have to turn our paper to measure it. And then we start again from zero, and we measure the angle, 138 degrees. This one, we must turn our paper again from the zero line. You can even start from the other line to measure it. From zero up to 110, 111 degrees. Okay, so we measure the angles exactly. And that's a lot of marks that we can get by just using your ruler and protractor. Use your protractor to measure all these angles. They all are acute angles, so if you get an answer more than 90 degrees, you must know you are on the wrong track. We must measure 3 centimeters and 3 centimeters and measure exactly 60 degrees and exactly 90 degrees. So this line is perpendicular to AC and measure your 60. This one must be 120 degrees and also a line of 3 centimeters. The different types of triangles, the side and the angle of 90 degrees, the area of all this gray part, this is a right angle triangle because it has an angle of 90 degrees. All these, no, this side, let's say this is A, B, C, and we can see that A, B is equal to A, C. 
And then we can see that angle B is the same size as angle C. Right, it could be 80 degrees each or not 90 because that's too much. Because we know that all the angles add up to 180. So one angle of a triangle can't be 90 degrees. Um, if you have two angles in an isosceles triangle. But the two angles, B and C, are equal. And the sides AB and AC are equal. The equilateral triangle, all the sides are equal and all the angles are equal. So all the angles must be 60 degrees. 180 divided by 3, so each angle will be 60 degrees. The scalene triangle. The scalene triangle has three sides that are of different lengths and three angles that are also have different sizes. So everything is different, the sides and the angles. The obtuse triangle, we have one angle that is between 90 and 180 degrees. So one angle that is a big angle. So that's the obtuse angled triangle. The acute angle triangle, all the angles are small, less than 90 degrees. For example, this one is 60 degrees, 80 degrees, then this one must be 40 degrees. For example, I did not measure it. Line symmetry, symmetry, very nice, the mirror image. How to identify the lines of symmetry. The line of symmetry divides the shape in two identical halves. Each of the following two dimensional shapes has one line of symmetry. And it's indicated by the broken line. Very nice. There we see the A with a dotted line and each of the following has more than one line of symmetry. Okay, those ones, they all have only one line of symmetry. These ones have more than one line of symmetry. This one has two lines, this one has one line, and even there's a line. Two lines there, this one even has three lines. One, two, three, four lines of symmetry. And examples of shapes that do not have any lines of symmetry. Here we see them, the J and this one. There are no lines of symmetry for these ones. Because if you fold your picture, it will not um, lie exactly on the other pattern. So if you imagine that you are folding your picture, it must be exactly on top of the other pattern. If it differs and they don't fall on each other, then you know there is no line of symmetry. In triangles, the isosceles triangle, the two equal sides, has only one line of symmetry. There we see the line of symmetry. The equilateral triangle, with the three equal sides and the three equal angles, has one, two, three lines of symmetry. So we can draw from each angle in the middle our three lines. The scalene triangle, three sides of different lengths, has no line of symmetry. So there is no line of symmetry in the scalene triangle. <coughs> okay, here are some nice activities. For each shape, state how many lines of symmetry it has. So draw the lines. Let the learners draw the lines of symmetry to see if they are drawing three lines, they know they have three lines of symmetry. If there are no lines, then they must know these no. And then they must imagine how they fold the one side on top of the other side. It must be lying exactly on. It's nice to have tracing paper to do this. And if you can draw the figures on tracing paper so the learners can cut it out and fold the papers. Right, number two, complete each of the diagrams so that in each case the broken line forms the line of symmetry. So they must complete the picture. Very nice. 
and even number three, they must also complete the diagrams. How to identify different kinds of quadrilaterals. Quadrilaterals also very nice for the learners to do. They start doing this even in grade one. The square with the lines of um, symmetry. Here you see all the lines. Rectangle, the parallelogram does not have any lines of symmetry. The rhombus, all sides are equal, the opposite angles are equal, there are two lines of symmetry. So complete it and do it, the rhombus. All sides, let's complete it because I see it's not here. The rhombus, let's make all the sides two centimeters. Two centimeters. And the opposite sides must be parallel to each other. This is not very accurate, but we see it's two centimeters each of these sides. And they say the opposite angles are equal. And all the sides are equal. All right. And they say there are two lines of symmetry. Where are the two lines of symmetry? Are they here? Can we draw it over here? Will the opposites fall onto each other if we draw it like this? Or must we draw it like this? Will the two parts fall onto each other if we draw it like this? Right, all sides are equal, the opposite angles are equal, and there are two lines of symmetry. Make sure you know which ones that is. And the trapezium. There are no lines of symmetry. Trapezium, we know. Trapezium. Looks like this. With the two opposite sides parallel, but not the same length, they are only parallel. And the kite. If we have the kite, it has two, it's, it has one line of symmetry. This guy doesn't look very nice, but if you have your line of symmetry, it will be going like that. So this triangle and that one fall onto each other. And this triangle, the other one will fall onto that one. It will also be nice for the learners to draw these different three-dimensional shapes, the cube, the cuboid, the cylinder, how to draw those ones exactly and nicely. The cube, all the sides the same length, for example, two centimeters each. That <clears throat> at the cuboid. First draw a cube, or not a cube, a rectangle. Here you draw a cube, and then you make sure you can see that it has three dimensions like that. And show the learners how the cylinder looks like in real life, how it looks like. That one is a bit skewed there, it must be like that. And the pyramid, how that one looks, and the sphere, 
like a soccer ball or a netball ball. They must know how it looks like the prism and the pyramid. Right, so that was the unit seven. Now we can carry on with unit eight. Unit eight. Okay, that is on the perimeters, the area, and the volume of the three dimensional shapes and two dimensional shapes. They are the learning outcomes. <coughs> So if you have to do the following, suppose you have to calculate the perimeter for the right angle below. Up to now, you would do it in the following way, the length plus the width plus the length plus the width. So it is 7 centimeters. We can draw it quickly because I see it's not here. 7 centimeters and 4 centimeters. This space is a big too small but um, you can imagine it yourself seven and four we can see it is two times the length because it's seven each time and two times the breadth or the width and we can say it is two times seven plus two times four and add it up two times seven fourteen two times four is 8, 22 centimeters. Right. But first of all, always write down your formula so that you can work according to your formula always. Otherwise, you think you know how to do it and then you start doing it wrong because you did not write down your formula. So 2 times the length plus 2 times the width. The formula for calculating the perimeter of a rectangle is P, two times the length plus the width. So you can do it like this as well. Two times, seven is the length plus four is the width. <coughs> we know that we first must do the brackets. So two times 11, which is again 22 centimeters. The perimeter of a square, this square is 7 centimeters by 7 centimeters. 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7, or we could say 4 times 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 times 7, which is also 28 centimeters. So the formula is... P is, the perimeter is equal to 4 times the length of one side, 4 times 7. So the formula is correct. Once the learners have done this themselves, they will remember how we find the perimeter of a rectangle and of a square. Okay, and there are some other examples of how you can find the perimeters of shapes and then they don't give you the drawing but they just ask you to find the figures perimeter so if it's easier you can draw your square and this one is 15 centimeters in each case so 15 times 4 for this square number B a rectangle with a length 8 and a width 6 so it might be easier for the learners to see that you draw the rectangle with the 8 and the 6. There are two 6s and two 8s. So it is 2 times 6 plus 8 or 8 plus 6. It will give you the same. 2 times 14, which is 28. The rhombus. We know that the rhombus has... Four sides that are all the same length. 
it's like a square that's a little bit skew. So 4 times 9. An equilateral triangle, equilateral, we must know that all the sides are equal. Each one is 7 centimeters times 3, because the triangle has 3 sides. A quadrilateral with a different length of sides, and it's in meters, centimeters, meters, and centimeters. So we must make it the same unit, either meters or centimeters, before we do that. The area of squares and rectangles. Area, they must know it's the side or the part inside the figure. For example, that part. The area of squares and rectangles. The surface area. How we can do that. And the units, the abbreviations for the units that we use. A square millimeter, we will write millimeters with a 2 there. And that is how we calculate it, millimeters times millimeters, to find the square. The square centimeters, centimeter times centimeter. And the square meter, meter times meter, that we always use when we have area. If we have volume, then we are working with area is meters square, and volume is meters to the power 3. Because the area is meters times meters, and volume is meters times meters times meters. So that's why we have meters to the power 3 cube meters, cubic meters, and this one is meters times meters to the power 2 square meters. So area has square meters and volume has cubic meters. That's important to teach the learners that as well. And square kilometers, kilometers to the power 2, written like that. The area of a rectangle, in this case 5 times 3, 15 square meters. And in this case we have the area of the rectangle. The area is 40, that's given, and the length is 10. So times what? What times 10 is 40? Or 40 divided by 10 is what? We know that the width of this figure will be then 40 divided by 10, which is 4 centimeters. So we can find the width of a rectangle by dividing. And then there are areas that we can find again. The following shapes, they did not draw it here. Now we would like to come to the volume of cubes and cuboids. We must be able to calculate the volume of cubes and cuboids by using the formula. So we must know the formula and the rules, how we find it. The formula of uh, Calculating the volume of a cuboid is the length times the width times the height. So volume is length times W times H. And then the equation can be written in different ways. The length is now the volume divided by the width times the height. Or the width is the volume divided by the length times the height. If we want to find the width. And if we have to find the height, we can say the height is the volume divided by the width times the length. So we must calculate the width times the length before we divide it into the volume. Or you can divide the volume by the width and then divide it by the length. But it's easier to just multiply the width and the length and then divide it into the volume. Cubic millimeters, cubic centimeters, and cubic meters. The examples. Here we see the volume of a cuboid that has a length of 6 and 5 and 3. We simply multiply and we find the answer. Example 2, there's a pool in the form of a rectangle with a length this and the width that. 
the water in the pool has a depth of 50 centimeters. Make sure you make the centimeters meters before you start. So 50 centimeters is 0.5 meters because we know there are 100 centimeters in one meter. So the volume multiply and then we get it's 9 cubic meters. Example 3 is more a bit tricky. The volume of a cuboid is 100 cubic centimeters. The length is this and the width is that. What is the height? So we must find the height. And we know there is a formula that we can use. The height is the volume divided by the length times the width. So it is 2 centimeters in this case. There are some learning activities that could be done. And the summaries you can always read through. Right, that's the one on the volumes and the area. The next topic is on direct and indirect proportion with all the activities that could be done, outcomes, the basic competencies, and then some examples. These big numbers, the learners like these big numbers. 1,000 is 10 times 10 times 10, or 10 to the power 3. And 1 billion, 1 and 9 zeros. So you can write it like that, and the 9, you can write there, so it's nine, a 10 to the power 9, instead of writing all the 10s there. So to write in standard form is much easier and smaller numbers that you can write. Make this in standard form. So we can <coughs> do all these <coughs> examples with the learner. Sorry. The big numbers, the large numbers, has a positive index. For example, 6,6 6 times 10 to the power 5 is a very, very big number. A small number, very small number. For example, this one, 6 times 10 to the power negative 4 is a very, very small number. 0, 0, 0,0006 or whatever. So, it is a very small number. And to work with a calculator, write down the full calculator display if you do this. So the learners can see it's a big number, a big number. And these are very small numbers. Zero comma zero zero. We can do this. Um, 5.8 times 10 to the power. Where is it now on this calculator? <coughs> The power negative 10. So it will give you a very small number, this one. And this one is not so very small because it's only negative 2. They say the feedback on this learning Activities provided at the end of this module. So if you are not sure about the answers, you can have a look there at the back of your module and see there. And calculator work is very important if you do this type of chapter. And to write this in standard form, all these different activities. Work out the following given my uh, your answer in standard form. This looks like um, grade 11 work. And the skills that you need to use a calculator efficiency, efficiently. Recognize the operations that the keys on the calculator represent. And make sure you use always your, the same calculator. 
Okay, let's go to direct that indirect proportion. Let's look at some examples that we can see here. Direct proportion. Okay, let's look at this example of direct proportion. If five loaves of bread cost 37,5, how much will eight loaves cost? The cost of the bread is proportional to the number of loaves because all the bread are the, having the same price. This is a direct proportion problem. So five is $37.50. So what is 1? We divide it by 5. So 1 bread is 7,5. And if you have to work out 8, then we can say it is 8 times 7,5. We can say it like this. We need to find the price of 8 loaves. 8 loaves divided by 5, and it was 37,50 over 1. Or you can say 37,5 over 5 to find the price of 1 bread. And to find the price of 8 breads, you multiply with 8. So you will get the same answer. 8 divided by 5 times this, or the price of the 5 breads divided by 5 times 8. You'll get the same answer. So there they are giving us some examples of that. So what is direct proportion and what is indirect proportion? They like this question in the exam papers. Direct proportion is one quantity increases or decreases in the same proportion as the other quantity increases or decreases. Indirect, one quantity increases or decreases in the same proportion as the other quantity decreases or increases. Here's a different method for finding the answer to the example used above. Alright, so let's go through this example. If a man travels at 30 kilometers per hour, he can get from his home to his work in 24 minutes. How long will it take him if he traveled at 36 kilometers per hour? So he travels faster now. At 30 kilometers per hour, it takes 24 minutes. So what is 1 kilometer? It will take 30 times 24. How do we know that we must multiply? Think about it this way, at the speed of 1 kilometer per hour. Slower speed, it will take longer than at the speed of 30 kilometers per hour. So we must multiply. So at 36 kilometers per hour, it will take 30 times 24 divided by 36. So it will take 20 minutes. It will take a shorter time if it travels faster. And how do we know that we must divide? Think about it in this way, at the speed of 30 kilometers per hour, the higher speed, it will take less time than at the speed of 24 kilometers per hour. So that's why we must divide. So we multiply, and then we must divide when it takes a shorter time. Let's look at this example. So we must make sure and make sense of what we are doing. Example two, if a man works six hours a day, he can do a job in four days. How many hours a day must he work to do the same job in only three days? Think if he must do the job in fewer days, only three days instead of four days, it means he must work more hours per day. To do the job in four days, you work six hours. To do the job in one day, the man must work four times six hours a day. So to do the job in three days, he must work 24 divided by three, he must work eight hours per day. Right, there are some activities then, and examples of this.
the Cartesian coordinates in two dimensions. Let's look at this, the Cartesian coordinates. The x-axis and the y-axis with the numbers, like that. We always plot the x-axis first, and then we plot the number on the y-axis. For example, if you have to plot the uh, coordinate 2 on the x-axis and y on the y-axis, we first go to the x-axis. There we are, to the 2, and on the y-axis to 1. So we 2 and 1 are meeting. That is the point 2, 1. That is the point 2, 1. In this case, let's see this one. If we have the x-axis and the y-axis, and we have to plot, for example, on the x-axis, we have to plot, for example, um, minus 2, and on the y-axis, we have to plot the point let's say 1. We go to the x-axis first, to minus 2, and on the y-axis we go to 1. So that is the point where we have minus 2 and 1. So the x-coordinate is always first, and the y-coordinate is always um, second. And the origin, that is the name, the letter O, like that, the coordinates are 0, 0. 0 for x and 0 for y. 0, 0, that is the origin. Then sometimes they ask you to do four points that you have to plot on the Cartesian um, diagram, the coordinates. So then you will have four different or five different points, A, B, C, D, E in this case where you have to plot the points. Quite easy to do that. Interpreting the straight line graph. When you draw the graphs and interpret them, remember the following two important rules. Make sure that the spaces between the numbers on each axis are equal. And work out what each small square represents on each of the axes. What is each small square? The straight line graph, for example, in this case, a direct relationship. Let's look at the relation x is equal to y. So the x's are equal to y all the time. So if you draw this graph, your x and y are equal. You can plot all the points. You will get the point 1, 1, 0, 0, 2, 2, like that. It will run like this. The graph passes through the origin. There it goes through the origin in the direct north, east. North, east, south, and west. So it will go like that. This means that two variables, x and y, are direct proportional. So this one is direct proportions. Because all the x values are the same as the y values. And here we see an indirect relationship where x is equal to minus y. So let's try to plot this one. Um, the x-axis must go from minus 2 up to 2. So let's see how I can work this out. All the spaces must be the same. Don't make it 2 and then 1 and then 2 and what, what, what. They must be the same. From minus 2 up to 2 and to y-axis. Y-axis must also go from 2 up to minus 2. So we don't need a very long line. There's the 1, 2, 3. The 1, 2, 3. 
for the y-axis and the x-axis. With the x, okay, let's write down some of these values. Minus 2 on the x-axis and 2 on the y-axis. I don't have graph paper now, so I have to try to work accurately. 1 on the x-axis and minus 1, and 2 on the x-axis and minus 2. So we get a straight line like that. And we always label... This is our graph of y is equal to minus x. The graph of y is equal to minus x. So from this table, we can see that the value of x increases by 1 and the value of y decreases by 1. We can now plot these pairs of numbers on graph paper. Right, so there we have this. And... We arrange it to the, and sometimes they don't give us the, the y value, so we have to work it ourselves. So we replace, in this case, for example, they give us the x values, minus 2. So what is y is equal to minus 2? The minus, minus 2. So what is y? If x is now um, minus 2, there's our minus 2 for the x, and there's the other x. So minus times minus, so y is equal to minus times minus plus 2. So then we have to find the x, which is 2 in this case. So we just replace it with a value. And here are some activities that could be done. There are websites that you can visit. To have more information. And at the back of the units, there you get all the answers that are there to help you if you are working out something and you don't know exactly what the answer should be. The next unit is on money, volume, and surface area, which is also a very nice hands on life experience that you see there. Simple interest. Okay, let's start here with simple interest. Simple interest is calculated with this formula. P times R times T. So, to calculate the interest earned on 3,000 Namibian dollars deposited in a bank for three years at a rate of 5% interest per year. So what is the interest, the I? It is the money and the rate and the time. So 3,000 times 5 over 100, remember the 100 because it's 5%, there's our percentage sign is the 100, and for 3 years. So 3,000 times 5 times 3 divided by 100. We can cancel the zeros, two zeros at the top and at the bottom, and then 30 times 5 times 3. 450 is the interest that you will get if you invest your money. But now we have sometimes the compound interest. Compound interest for the situation above. We can illustrate the situation like this. 3,000. 3,000, 5% for the first year, for one year. So it's 150. Then you have 3,000 plus 150. The end of December for the next year, the second year, 3,150. 3, and then your interest is 5,100. So you will have the interest of 15750. You add 15750 to your money that you had in the beginning. 
3150 and now you have $3,307.50. The third year, now we use the previous year, the second year's money. So, three zero, three three zero seven fifty. we use the same, and 5% interest. So, we use that money for the third year, times 5%. And the profit that you make now, the interest, 1,165.38, you add this to what you had in the beginning of your third year, so 3,307.50 plus 1,65.38, now you have 3,472.88 cents. Alright, so this year, after three years, you will have for compound interest more money than in the simple interest case. Right, let's see the simple interest examples here. We can see that if you have 500 Namibian dollars and it's invested at 10% per year per annum, simple interest, how much money is earned in three years, the interest rate is 10%. So for one year, it is 10 over 100 times 500. That's 50. So after three years, the interest will be 3 times 50. 150. So we must make sure we understand the question before we just carry on and use the formula. Example 2, how long will it take for 250? million dollars that is invested at a rate of 8% per annum. Simple interest to amount to 310. The end amount is the principal amount, the amount in the beginning, plus the interest. So the end amount minus the principal. So 310 minus 250. So we must see how much money we must make on interest. So it must be $60, 310 minus 250. Now, how long will it take for the interest to amount to $60? The interest for one year is 8% times 250. So you make 20 in one year. So it will take 20 times what to make 60? 60 divided by 20. So it will take three years to make your 60 Namibian dollars. So it will take three years for 250 to grow to 310 at the rate of 8% per annum. Simple interest. Right. Let's look at example three. This is also real life. A farmer gets a loan of 8,000 and repays the loan at the end of five years. So it takes five years to pay the money back. He paid back a total of 12,000. What rate of simple interest did the farmer pay per annum? So he got a loan of 8,000, but he had to pay back 12,000. Let's look at the uh, solution of this example. The principal amount was 8,000. He repaid 12,000. So the amount of interest paid after five years was 12 minus 8, so 4,000. So this means that the interest on 8,000 for five years is 4,000. So the interest on 8,000 for one year is 8, is 4,000 divided by 5. Five years, he had to pay back 4,000 more than he used. So that is uh, 4,000 divided by 5, 800. 800 divided by the 8,000, the principal money that he borrowed, and um, times 100%. So you can cancel your zeros, and then you can do that one, 10%. So that is 10%. The compound interest, 
you know that you have to work at year one, year two, year three, so it's a long sum that you have to do. You can't just jump to the simple interest. I'm looking now at the electricity bills that we get, that we all know. The meter readings and the description of the services and how much money you had to pay back. A lot of money. So, that's important that learners should know how to read the bill and to see what they are paying for water, for electricity, for refuse, uh, things that they have to take away, all those things. And then what is tax? What is tax for the accountants that are becoming CAs? What is tax? And what are the sum of the forms of tax? Which tax is paid by individuals or employees? It sometimes differ from year to year. And what taxation system we use in Namibia? All of us are paying tax even if we just buy bread or um, cell phone money then we all pay tax. So everybody is taxed, directly or indirectly. And income tax, if you are working, how much you pay the government for services like schools and hospitals and roads, what you have to use there. All the different formula that the government are using to tax you on money. Right, I think we can stop here, then we can carry on for the next one on the total surface area of the cuboid and the area of the rectangles in a net that are added together. So we will carry on on the next one with that.